Welcome, everybody. Thank you for having me, Rich. Really cool to be here. Um, you know, I did when I was uh, doing undergrad and grad work, I did teach quite a few uh, student class uh, situations, but I never taught an entire semester. I, I left the university setting because uh, I really felt like I could do better doing it autonomously. And here we are at autonomy. So I think Richard has the right idea about where to go with education. Um, but I've been into and studying philosophy at various levels and in various ways for about 20 years. So I'm happy to uh, be here, honored to be here. Um, I do have uh, some unique takes that I think will be uh, different than what you would get in a, in a traditional legacy university setting. So hopefully we can um, get into some of that tonight, kicking it off, and we're going to get pretty deep. So, um, you know, jot down your questions. Uh, I, I'm a big uh, fan of open Q&A at the end. You know, we've done uh, in my Discord, I think we have about eight or 9,000 in the Discord. Uh, and we've been doing these open Q&As that go sometimes six, 10 hours. So I'm totally used to that. Uh, very happy to have people ask, uh, you know, lengthy uh, end of, of lecture Q&As. So be sure and jot down your questions and I will answer them to the best of my abilities. You're not going to offend me. You're not going to, it's not going to bother me if you disagree, if you think I'm wrong about something, you know, you don't like, uh, we're not going to be talking a whole lot about theism or any of that tonight. That doesn't really uh, play into tonight's topic. So if you're uh, anti-theist, if you're agnostic, none of that bothers me. Uh, it's fine for you to, uh, you know, have your positions. I'm not going to be coming at you or critiquing your positions unless you want that, right? So you can request that, <laughs> sir. I would like you to request, I would like to request a demolishing of my paradigm. I'm happy to offer that if you want that. Most people don't really want that. But um, tonight's going to just gonna be an introduction. So we're going to look at what is uh, philosophy all about. <clears throat> um, the object of this course will be to take us from uh, this introductory uh, situation to a, a pretty good knowledge, a deep knowledge, hopefully, that's what we're going to shoot for, of the history of Western philosophy. Obviously, we have to pick some starting points. We can't go back and do all of Indo-European philosophy, we can't do all the Babylonian, Assyrian philosophy and whatnot, but what's most relevant, I think, for us in the West is the history of Western philosophy, and like I said, I've, you know, I've had this course uh, at the legacy institutional setting uh, many times over and, and in many, in many, uh, in many different ways, so I'm going to give you a better version of that, um, and, and I think, again, this is really the, the way to do it, really, Richard is really pioneering when it comes to where education is going. So let's get into uh, philosophy. What is philosophy? Well, <clears throat> you see, I have there a, a couple of figures that's uh, from a, actually from a monastery, an Orthodox monastery where you have uh, five philosophy guys and uh, you know, they don't have halos. So in the Orthodox view, there's not going to be a perception of the philosophers as equivalent to what you would get in divine revelation. But regardless um, some of the things that are going to be present in my lecture is that we're not going to see a strict divide between um, the various theisms, because we're going to notice uh, that as we go through the history of philosophy, there's a ton of theisms. So again, no matter what you think about theism, we're going to need to understand these people's positions from their vantage point. All right, Aristotle has a famous quote <clears throat> attributed to Aristotle that it's a mark of an educated man to understand the opponent's position without adopting it. And we want to keep that in mind as we work, we, as we work through <clears throat> these various philosophers, because this is crucial to having the upper hand, right? And I, I, when I say the upper hand, I mean in anything. If you're, if you're in business, if you're in debate, if you're in um, law, right, whatever you're into, if you want to have the upper hand, if you want a personal advantage, it's always better to know your opponent's position at least as good as they do, right? Sometimes we can't achieve that, but um, to have that edge, uh, that's what you want to shoot for. So keep in mind, no matter what your view, we, what we want to strive for, and I think this is a virtue, we're going to get to what virtue and vice and all that is later on when we get to ethics. I think it's actually a virtue to know the position that you're against, even if you completely hate it and reject it. Know it as best you can. That's what we're going to shoot for. And so those are some of the preliminary considerations as we get into this. I want to <clears throat> remind you too that I find it most helpful to break philosophy down into three main branches. Those branches are epistemology, metaphysics, and ethics. Sometimes the, the phrase or the word aesthetics is added to ethics. We will get to that as well. Let's get into it. 
So I will, uh, I did choose source materials. You don't have to get these source materials unless you uh, choose to. I would recommend them because they, they're they going to be what I'm working from in terms of the text. I will at times refer to these texts um, for various uh, source material for pages that I think are really, you know, insightful. Um, that will be uh, the famous text from Copleston, which is history of Western philosophy or history of philosophy. I think it's like four or five volumes. We're only going to be uh, uh, early on concerned with volume one and volume two, because that covers the ancient and medieval periods. Uh, I will be using and sourcing at times the uh, well-known text on epistemology. It's very common in a lot of grad courses or undergrad courses by Lawrence Bonjour, epistemology. And there's a three-part series that uh, matches up to the, the to the classification system that I gave um, by these guys. And I think they're very good because, again, they focus on um, virtue in these in these domains, especially in the terms of epistemology and ethics. And that's going to be very crucial for where we go in this course. Uh, you know, I know uh, Richard makes a, a lot of uh, a great point throughout his talks to talk about ethics and why, you know, having an edge in business uh, is necessary. It's necessary to be ethical. We want to be ethical. We want to display not in a showy way, but we want to have a good reputation. Right. How are you going to have a good business or good business or repertoire if you have a bad rep? right? If you're known as the dude that scams everybody and lies and cheats, right? So ethics will definitely play into this. And you're going to see, I think that um, ethics is very important and crucial to philosophy. And that a lot of this is practical, although it may seem early on that a lot of what we're going to talk about is abstract. You know, how does this relate to my business? We're talking about freaking monads. We're talking about, you know, crazy four elements and all this mystical crap that doesn't relate to the practical. I've sh I assure you that it will. But if you stick, if you stick it out, right, you're going to see that you might not see that uh, early on, <clears throat> but if you stick it out, you will. And so I recommend the W.J. Wood book on epistemology, the William Hasker text on metaphysics and the Arthur Holmes text on ethics. Now, the three on the right are very easily uh, accessible to people that may not know a lot about philosophy. So if you're new to philosophy, I'm going to recommend the three on the right there uh, to start with because the bonjour epistemology text is a little advanced and the uh, the Coppelson text is uh, maybe in between right so you might you might see that when it's kind of in between the, the other two uh, and then as I said I didn't put it on screen but there's also uh, Coppelson's volume two which deals with medieval philosophy so those, those are our sources obviously there are some other sources that are going to matter or be referenced here and there um, for students of philosophy, everybody should know about the Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy. It's very well known in academia. It's commonly referenced as well as, uh, I forget which university puts this one out, but it's the Internet Encyclopedia of Philosophy. Those will also be sourced at times, uh, you know, just for various, various reference, references to uh, uh, words, terms, definitions, and so forth. Um, when I refer to Plato, uh, I'll put some of these uh, up later when we do other slides, but we'll be, we'll be using various texts from Plato's Republic. Uh, I use the Groove translation and then also uh, the Bollingen series of Plato, which is a collective works of Plato for some of the dialogues. That'll be the next lecture, though. So we're not going to be getting into Plato tonight because uh, one of the things that we want to we understand is that <clears throat> philosophy is a uh, centuries-long discourse. And just as if you were to walk into a bar, right, and you uh, were right in the middle of uh, some dirty story, right, of two you know, drunk dudes in the bar or some wine mom in the bar whining about her uh, ex-husband you wouldn't know the whole story would you you would only know you know what why mom is saying at this moment right you want to know uh who slept with who you want to know where they're from you want to who's cheating on who right well maybe you guys don't but that's what i'm getting at with with knowing the whole story here is that the way philosophy works is that it's a centuries-long conversation basically the dude that's selling his stuff today is going to be destroyed and demolished by the dude critiquing him tomorrow. And this will go on for basically the last 2,500 years. And that's what we're going to be focusing on in terms of this course. <clears throat> so we need to know, <clears throat> for example, who uh, was saying what before Plato that put Plato into the setting that he was in, right? Because there's a bunch of discourse and debate prior to Plato that really, you can't really understand Plato without that. So in other words, we're going to have to step back and understand <clears throat> some of the pre-Athens uh, philosophy, the pre-Socratics, 
or they're sometimes called the Milesians or the Ionian philosophers and what they were debating, what they were asking, because they really initiate philosophy. In fact, Aristotle himself says that um, it's, it's the pre-Socratics that, and we'll look at this specifically in a moment, that initiate or uh, begin the process of what is properly philosophy. Now, yeah, you could widen that definition uh, such that any ancient religion or empire had a philosophy. And we're going to look at a little bit of that too. But um, for Western philosophy in particular, again, thinking about our threefold division of epistemology, metaphysics, and ethics. It's going to be the pre-Socratics that first initiate this question. And they do it because they uh, begin to move out of the domain of myth and storytelling. So prior to them, we'll look at in a minute, uh, Homer, Hesiod, these uh, playwrights, these uh, tra oral tradition storytellers, for them, um, virtue and vice is, is essentially known via mythic or mythopoetic storytelling. It's not primarily known through abstraction. This is going to be a huge step that a lot of these pre-Socratics are going to take away from myth towards reason, rationality, <clears throat> abstraction, and stepping away from myth and storytelling. Now, this is not to uh, cast aspersions on myth and storytelling. Uh, we're not uh, making judgments either way. We're simply understanding the course of philosophy uh, as it progresses historically, because again, you... This, I have to stress this because a lot of people don't know how to approach philosophy, right? They, they just pick up David Hume and start reading him. And you can't understand David Hume if you don't understand the metaphysics of the Middle Ages, right? Because Hume comes on the scene in the Enlightenment and says, as a skeptic, right, we need to throw out all the metaphysics that came before. Well, if I don't know what the metaphysics came before or I don't know what he's talking about. Likewise, I can't understand Kant without understanding David Hume because Kant's whole philosophy is a reaction to Hume. And we're going to see... Uh, that throughout the history of Western philosophy, it's a constant position, reaction, interchange. And <clears throat> sometimes this is referred to as dialectics. Now, dialectics, I, I'm going to have more, I'll have more definitions later on on screen for you guys. But as we get into more of the precise terminology, we don't have to really worry about dialectics tonight. But I do want to bring it up because it's going to be recurring themes. I want you guys to pay attention to themes that will recur <clears throat> throughout uh, this lecture series. Dialectics will be one of them because <clears throat> we're going to see, especially in the Greeks and throughout the whole history of Western philosophy, dialectical tension. And remember, dialectics means different things in different contexts. Sometimes dialectics means just the methodology of teaching to uh, back and forth question asking, dialogue, right? Sometimes dialectics means something more uh, metaphysical, which in the sense of like actual principles in the world that are in tension with one another. Is there a, a stark war between um, determinism and free will, right? That's a dialectical uh, characterized question, right? The setting for that is already kind of set up as dialectical, right? Are you a determinist or do you believe in free will? Well, that assumes that there's not some form of compatibilism, right? Now, I'm not saying which of those is correct or wrong. I'm just saying that you can see that a lot of times questions can be framed in a dialectical way. And I want you to pay attention to that because as we go through a lot of these, especially these pre-Socratics, you're gonna notice that <clears throat> they really are operating on a lot of these kinds of assumptions. So we wanna pay attention to that. Uh, we wanna have some of those things in mind. <clears throat> but before we get to that, after we've uh, looked at some of these course materials, rough course syllabus. Uh, this is what we're looking at doing here. We're gonna do uh, this introductory class. Uh, this is, then we're gonna move to Plato. I'm gonna try to squeeze Plato into one talk. These could e each of these people, as we know, could easily be an entire course. Um, they're very difficult, especially the pre-Socratics, Plato and Aristotle, um, but we're going to tackle it. Um, I have a lot of friends that are in academia that are also solid uh, people that I think you guys would really like, you guys really benefit from. So I'm going to have a couple of guests, uh, uh, expert lecturers come in to also co-teach and to do a little Q&A with me on the epistemology class. I'm going to do the metaphysics class. We're going to uh, lump aesthetics with ethics. I'll bring a guest expert in as well for that. <clears throat> Probably somebody who's a, a Renaissance expert. Um, then we're going to look at the Stoics and the Neoplatonists together for the or, or early uh, non-Christian uh, philosophy, the meditations of, uh, for example, Marcus Aurelius. And we'll look at some of the Roman philosophers. Then we're going to move to the uh, what's called the patristic period, which means the church fathers. Again, regardless of what you think of Christianity, 
uh, you know, I doesn't, I'm not really here to, to get into that with you tonight, unless you guys want to talk about those things. I'm happy to, but that's not really primarily the focus of this course is not going to essentially be Christianity. It's just going to be the history of Western philosophy. However, whatever one thinks of uh, Christianity or religion, we do have to treat this very crucial, very influential period in uh, the history of the West. And we're not going to restrict it to Latin or Western church fathers, as many college courses do. We're going to look at uh, figures who were crucial and uh, very influential in other civilizations like Byzantium, particularly the Cappadocians, John of Damascus, uh, uh, very famous uh, patristic church fathers, as they're called, who were heavily philosophical. So um, Augustine, a towering figure, obviously in the early church, had many, many, many thousands of pages of philosophical writings. And we're going to look at those. And um, he's crucial as well because he's very influenced by the Neoplatonists, right? Uh, as are the Cappadocian church fathers, Basil, Gregory, and Gregory. Basil and the two Gregories, basically, we're going to look at them uh, in terms of their metaphysics, their approach to uh, how the world is structured. And as you can see, I mean, this encompasses, you know, at least uh, this isn't even all of them. You've got I've got 38 volumes up here. Uh, and probably half of these volumes deal with uh, Augustine, Cappadocian, John Damascus. So I'm going to compact all of that into uh, one long course. Then we're going to get into medieval philosophy in general, which those guys prepare the way for. Um, and then we have to know this because we're not going to be able to understand the Enlightenment, what it's reacting against, unless we understand some of the medieval scholastic philosophy. So uh, again, that'll be compacted. Uh, we won't go super deep into all that because that could be its own course, right? People get their PhD in even just one of the thinkers um, in any of these domains. Um, so we want to shoot for uh, an overview. Uh, we, like I said, when we get to Descartes and the Enlightenment, we're going to look at that uh, as its reaction to the medieval uh, period. Uh, again, this is not to uh, demolish or destroy all the Enlightenment philosophers. In fact, they're going to have a lot of good arguments against medieval philosophers. So we want to try to look for good arguments is another thing to try to uh, uh, train yourself to do in terms of philosophy. We want to look for good arguments, irrespective of the man, irrespective of the person making the argument. Do they have a good argument? Because guess, guess what? Even the worst philosopher, I don't care who you, who you think is the worst, he's probably got one good argument here or there. And it's kind of on a spectrum, right? I'm not a big fan of Hegel. But I think Hegel has some really interesting insights here and there. Same with uh, Immanuel Kant, right? I'm not a Kantian. I'm not super into Kant, but I think Kant has some really fascinating insights that we're, we're going to talk to when we get to number 11 there, which is uh, the Enlightenment empiricists uh, and Kant's transcendental idealism. That is the Hume, Kant, Berkeley, Locke period. And then um, modern uh, collapse of philosophy. And yes, I will argue that it has pretty much collapsed. And by that, I mean what we classically thought of the doing of philosophy as doesn't really exist anymore and, that, and that's not to say that in the academic world or in the academic setting there aren't people doing philosophy there, there are there are but this is a, the, but what we thought of as philosophy in terms of the ancient and medievals has collapsed in the sense that we don't do that anymore now philosophy has turned into postmodernism. Um, which is essentially an anti-philosophical movement. It's actually ironically reverted back to storytelling. <laughs> That's a, the, the irony here is that what the pre-Socratics there in part one are going to be reacting to in Homer and Hesiod, ironically, we're going to notice that the modern collapse of philosophy uh, has basically returned, in terms of postmodernism, has returned to myth and storytelling because, of course, they will say that really every philosopher and everything is just myth storytelling or power relations right power oppressor narratives and so forth and certainly uh you know we could include uh, marx and so forth in all of these modern uh figures uh, or this modern era but it's just really difficult to um put everything uh into one course and so like richard said uh you know if everything works out we'll probably just do a second uh season uh of covering modern stuff you know and then we can do a class on darwin we can do a class on marx we can do a class and you might think well darwin oh yeah you're going to notice tonight, just like with what I just said about postmodernism being a return of an ancient view, you're going to notice quite a few things that are normative popular views today were already in the pre-Socratics and in the ancient philosophers. Again, <clears throat> I'm not here to try to convince you either way on these things. I have my views. I'm happy to, to give my takes. 
But again, what we want to stress and what we want to really, really strive for, because this is very difficult for a lot of people. I don't think this audience will be too difficult. I'm sure you guys are a, a sharp crowd. I'm sure you're striving to achieve objectivity. That's what we want to do. We want to understand these people, no matter what we think, even if we think it's the stupidest thing, right? That is, even I think that dude is retarded, right? I think if we think, you know, oh, Aristotle's the most retarded of all the philosophers, right? He was like riding the short bus to the Athens Academy, right? right? Whatever you think. I at least want you to understand Aristotle and be able to give the basics of what he thought to the uh, uh, to the uh, appeasement of me or anyone else who knows a decent amount about Aristotle, right? If you can do that, then you're, you, you have achieved what I'm after in this course, which is to give you the ability to speak to these topics fluently. And you're going to understand, again, how it relates to your life. A lot of this, again, will seem obscure and weird, but again, you're going to notice some of the most prominent views that people have in the world today that are thought of as new aren't really new. They're just repackaged, resurfacing, and they kind of represent similar debates, copy and pasted actually almost, from 2,500 years ago. So what is philosophy? Good idea. Yeah. <clears throat> Obviously, uh, probably many of you already know this. I won't spend too much time on the basics, but we do need to have just a little bit of an overview of what the basic terms are, what they're referring to, because we may have some people that are, are brand new. Um, love of wisdom. Philo, Sophia. Love of wisdom. Uh, Socrates famously said, the examined life is the only life worth living. Now, technically, he said the unexamined life is not worth living, but I'm, I'm paraphrasing to say, look, basically... He's just telling you that if you're just going through, through your, your, the motions day to day, if you've never sat down to contemplate what is life, who am I, what's the meaning of all this, is there a per point to life, uh, does the universe have a beginning, right? If you've never thought about those things, then you're kind of like a boring ass rock. And literally, that's how I think you know, some of the Greek philosophers would sort of, uh, so especially the ones that kind of had disdain for the masses, right? Some of these guys would just be like, these people are really no different than rocks. And they're even going to liken some of the people to rocks because they're, they're weighed down by the, uh, uh, the cares of this world and, and the material possessions and, the, and pleasures, right? The, the base passions or whatnot. They keep people uh, focused uh, not on the here and the now, or excuse me, not on the transcendent or on the ideal or on the true or whatever, but on the here and the now. And so they're kind of like determined uh, NPCs. This is the ancient Greek idea of the NPC. And I think uh, if we were to think of somebody like Socrates, who will be the teacher of Plato, he would definitely resonate with the NPC meme, right? He would probably be etching it out on tablets, right? And showing it to his, his fellow uh, philosophy students in his class. And so the idea here is that we want to... Uh, not just go through the motions, but want to understand the world and not just have knowledge. And this is an important distinction that will come up in the early Greek philosophers, not just having a bunch of data, right? There's, clearly there's a difference between, you know, some guy who's just a Spurg and like memorizes sports statistics, right? Uh, what's the Dustin Hoffman character? Rain Man, right? Uh, would you call Rain Man wise? No, he's just a sort of weird savant, you know, Spurg, right? Um, but what about a situation where, uh, you know, take the, again, what do you think of the Bible? Think is it the, the character of Solomon, Solomon in the Bible and Ecclesiastes Proverbs, he's touted for his wisdom. And certainly he, according to the Bible, knew a lot of things, but he wasn't just a key figure in history because he knew facts and could list them uh, on a spreadsheet or whatever, right? An ancient Hebrew spreadsheet, <laughs> But because he uh, had the application of that knowledge in the right way at the right time. And that's kind of what we're shooting for, for wisdom. So again, not just love of bare knowledge, but love of wisdom, the appropriate virtuous application of that knowledge at the right time and in the right way. Those are going to be some of the key questions that come up for philosophy and what a philosopher is. What, so what are we after? What do we do? What is a philosopher? What do they do? 
There's some of the basic questions they're going to be looking at. <clears throat> Philosophers do things like cross-examine. We want to know, uh, is what's being said to me coming from a rational, reasonable place? Is somebody lying to me? Are they trying to scam me? Are they duping me? Am I watching movies that are uh, full of propaganda? Right. Maybe I want to analyze this movie and say, hey, wait a minute, this is a Raytheon Boeing trying to sell me on some new Pentagon war that has, you know, the face of Jessica Chastain and Matt Damon on it or whatever. Right. So I'm cross examining a piece of art or a piece of propaganda in that case. Right. You're going into law. You're going into business. You want to you want to cross examine to see if this is a good deal. I don't know. Is it so what you might have thought isn't really the domain of philosophy for philosophers? It is philosophy. Right? We're engaged in cross-examination. Obviously, you could apply the law court. I mean, I think hopefully the law court example is uh, uh, obvious there, self-evident. I have to go into that really. But you know, cross-examination could come into anything. It could, it could come into a conversation that you're having at Thanksgiving dinner. Right? You're trying to convince your family members of their their, their terrible politics, right, and how they're uh, you know idiots for believing the the normie story of 9/11. Who knows, right? So. Let's say you're having that company and you want to cross examine, you want to analyze their bad arguments. So that's something philosophers are interested in. Philosophers are, are analytical. That means they do analysis. Now, not every philosopher is uh, always engaged in this, but it's certainly part of what philosophers do. And that's obviously very valuable. It's valuable in today's world. Obviously, a lot of what we do, whether it's economics, whether it's the arts, whether it's you know, computer programming, whatever you're into, you're going to need the skills and tools that allow you to be highly analytical. As we get into modern philosophy, this actually becomes its own branch of philosophy, analytical philosophy, which is sometimes contrasted with continental philosophy in the modern period. It's not exactly what we're talking about here. We're just speaking in a more general sense, but it will actually become its own kind of school, so to speak, of philosophy. So philosophers are uh, definitely engaged in analysis and primarily we're engaged in analysis of what? Those three things that we talked about at the beginning, that subdivision, epistemology, metaphysics, and ethics. That's in philosophy. But again, uh, this is a, one of the unique things about philosophy is that philosophy can be a philosophy of anything. And that might sound weird at first, but if you think about it, if you think about some of the uh, famous modern philosophers, uh, there is, of course, the character of Zizek. If you've seen Zizek, he does the philosophy of the toilet. Now, that seems ridiculous, but that's exactly what Zizek does. He's one of the most famous living philosophers out there today. One of the few uh, uh, existing, still explicitly sort of Marxist philosophers. And Zizek, who you know recently debated uh, Jordan Peterson, for example, no, no, no. Zizek does uh, 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 analysis from a Marxist vantage point of things like toilets. And on the one hand, that's kind of ridiculous. But at the same time, you think, well, toilets are part of our lives, aren't they? We spend quite a bit of our time on the toilet, right? So is it theoretically possible that you could do a analysis of toilets? Sure. Because didn't they say at one point that, I don't know, Trump has a golden toilet. I don't even know if that's true, but does Trump have a golden toilet? What does that signify in terms of the figure of Trump? Saudi princes with golden, golden toilets, right? So this is sort of beautification of a ritual that is very mundane, but also sort of, you know, base and gross, right? Shitting, right? So a philosophy of shitting. Now I'm being kind of, you know, silly here, but I'm also kind of making a point that uh, it really is the case that you can do a philosophy of anything. For example, uh, in some of my grad classes, we were getting into some of the guys who had done, <clears throat> I forget the guy's name, but he's a, 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 a semiotician guy who had done an uh, analysis of um, comedy, philosophy of comedy. Right? W what is it that makes us laugh? What is it that makes this thing funny versus absurd and not funny? What is it that makes, you know, faces funny? You could do a philosophy of anything is my point. So it will, it's broad in its scope in that it will range from a philosophy of things in the domain of philosophy, knowledge, metaphysics, ethics, to uh, weird and, and sort of fanciful figures and characters in philosophy who do philosophies of anything. We can do the philosophy of literary theory. We can do the philosophy of music. We can do the philosophy of comedy, as I said. So again, there's a there's a, a potentially a philosophy of anything and an analysis of anything from this kind of perspective. 
Philosophers are not just analytical, however, they're also intuitive. There's a, a lot of creativity actually that goes into the process of philosophy. Uh, some mathematicians, for example, I think Roger Penrose, and uh, if you read Paul Davies' book, uh, uh, Mind of God, he will talk about how there's actually a creative element that goes into even things like mathematics and geometry, right? I mean, some of the great philosophers and thinkers and, and mathematicians, they have the flashes of insight that don't come from some uh, obvious source. We don't really know where they get these flashes of insight, right? I mean, they, uh, for example, you know, the story about Nikola Tesla is that he would get a lot of his insights into these, you know, elaborate engines that he would build through these just visions that he would sort of pass out or whatever. That's the story at least, right? So philosophers are intuitive in that we are not just analytical robots. We also have a will, an intention, a creativity that we bring to the analysis. Again, we can be analyzing anything. It doesn't matter. Philosophers are constructive. In other words, they don't just focus on the particulars. Now, they may, in certain cases, if they're doing their dissertation on the particular, and that will actually be something very important in philosophy. But generally speaking, the philosopher is not just concerned with that. He also wants to get a big picture. He wants to construct a total picture about what's going on, what's our uh, situation in the world, what does life mean, et cetera. Is there meaning and order in the world? Is there meaning and order to be found? Right? These are the kinds of questions that we're going to be asking. And so philosophers are constructive and then they seek to build a total picture. Now, there's limits to that. Obviously, we don't mean in a literal sense of like, I'm going to build a total picture of everything in reality and everything that exists. Now, some of the technocrats might think that with total information awareness and, you know, this kind of Internet of things, they might think that. But typically speaking, outside of these sort of maniacal mad scientist uh, positions like the technocrats, typically philosophers, uh, the people that we're going to be analyzing and looking at, um, are, are seeking a total picture within some fixed domain or within some general framework. Okay, they're not looking for or, or attempting to create omniscience. However, we're going to see in some cases where they actually do try to reach that, right? We're going to see with, for example, Descartes. Descartes is going to try to find this indubitable and infallible reference point. Hegel will try to find this sort of omniscience or pseudo-omniscience within his uh, uh, process philosophy, for example. But typically, that's not what we're doing. Uh, however, many of them will try to build world systems, right, uh, from scratch. And that's something that we want to pay attention to. Um, so you guys want to jot down your questions and just save those for the end. And you can feel free when we get to the end to come back to uh, questions at any point. So just, just jot down if you want to, that you want to ask a question about sort of stuff early on. But um, it might be better to wait until we get through some of this uh, preliminary stuff before we start taking any questions. Uh, philosophers, uh, thus, in my and this is sort of, this is more so my my approach because some people would disagree with this, but I think that the philosophy and what philosophy is really about is worldview thinking. This is the attempt to uh, characterize uh, and uh, systematize man's knowledge and experience and show how these things are interrelated. That man's knowledge is not uh, totally fragmentary. It's not totally disconnected, discrete from other pieces of knowledge, other facts, and other humans and their experience. But that there is a commonly experienced world and our experiences and the facts that we experience and the, the knowledge that we obtain from the world is interrelated. There is a world historical, we might say. There is a worldview from which man can uh, build a system and posit right? Facts about the world, predicate things about the world. And lastly, uh, philosophers are concerned, in my view, with presuppositions. Now, this is specifically what the philosopher will be doing as he does philosophy, right? As we go through the history of philosophy, you're going to notice that each philosopher kind of does this thing where he reads the guys before him, and especially maybe the generation right before him, and he critiques, Philosophy doesn't have to be relegated to only critique, but critique is going to be crucial to the entire process of philosophy in the history of the West. Each guy will be critiquing the guy before him, pretty much across the board. There might be a few outliers here and there who try to do different things, and maybe they pop up and, you know, they just focus on maybe uh, literary theory, philosophy of uh, aesthetics, something like that. But most of the big people that we're going to be focusing on are the ones that are known as the big philosophers. They're typically concerned with critiquing the presuppositions, the basic commitments and assumptions of the guys that came before. 
So that's what we're going to be doing as well. And keep in mind that a lot of what you see there on that page is also what you as a philosopher will begin to do. Now, you might think, well, I'm not a philosopher. I didn't take all these classes. I don't, well, guess what? You have a philosophy and you are a philosopher, even if you don't know it. Even if you know nothing about philosophy, if I ask you simple questions in the domains of epistemology, metaphysics, and ethics, you might not even know what those words are. But if I ask you basic questions, you're going to have a view on some of those. You're going to have some idea about knowledge, even if you think that we can't have knowledge. That's still a position, right? That's an agnostic position, but it's still a position in epistemology, right? That you don't believe anybody has knowledge or you don't have knowledge or no one can have knowledge. If I asked you a question about ethics, right? Well, I think it's wrong to kill people. Okay, well then, so now you have a philosophy of ethics, right? Of virtue and vice right away, whether you know it or not. So everybody is a philosopher, even if they don't know it. Everybody has a philosophy because they have a worldview, even if it's a, a commitment to agnosticism, because everybody has basic commitments or beliefs or presuppositions when it comes to what are the three branches? Epistemology, metaphysics, and ethics. All right. <clears throat> Why? Uh, one more point here. I'll, I'll try to go through this uh, kind of quick because I don't want to spend too much time on uh, this is kind of a restatement of kind of what we talked about before. A lot of times people hear about philosophy and they'll say philosophy is useless and impractical word salad. I can't tell you how many times in the last 20 years I've heard this and my most, my most oft repeated boomer phrase. When I chose to study philosophy, every boomer, oh, the philosophy corporations hiring around you. <laughs> they thought that was the greatest joke ever, right? I never thought it was funny. That was dumb the first time. I heard it, and I still hear it. It's still dumb. But these are common objections that most people have to this whole domain. And it's why, for example, people like Neil deGrasse Tyson, you know, a couple few years ago, if you guys remember, basically said, don't waste your time. Philosophy is a useless enterprise. I wonder why. He was so emphatically opposed to philosophy. Well, it might be because he doesn't fare very well when asked philosophical questions. So that might have something to do with maybe more of a personal motivation. But uh, what are the, some of the pros then, again, that uh, what does philosophy help us do, right? So maybe you're not so interested in uh, uh, what philosophers do. How does it help you? What, is it, what do I get out of this? Philosophy helps us to think creatively because it makes us better at analysis, as I said, of anything. You're not going to fall for bad arguments. You're not going to fall for fallacies. You're not going to fall for dumb, stupid arguments. For example, emotional appeals. Now, I know that uh, one of Richard's buds has taught a really uh, excellent uh, uh, logical fallacies course, right? And one of those logical fallacies that comes up all the time, for example, is something like uh, emotional appeal, right? Oh, you don't want to support the war effort in xyz country i guess you hate the kids in those countries don't you i guess you want the kids to die right you want saddam to kill the kids right these are all ridiculous emotional appeals right in other words only a person who adopts their position cares about kids well that's a fallacy right so understanding philosophy helps us to think critically makes us better at analysis of anything it doesn't have to be politics it's going to help you analyze again business uh, situations right business deals. It's going to help you analyze the crypto market, right? For example, crypto deals a lot with human emotions and human psychology, right? If whales are dumping, you know that people are going to follow the whales and dump. So that's going to make you better at analysis if you know the modus operandi of human operation in markets, for example. And that's involved with, that, that involves philosophical critical thinking, even if we don't know these terms. Philosophy helps us think creatively. As we said, we have new approaches and angles to things. <clears throat> I remember uh, one of my um, philosophy professors made a good point when I was first coming into to philosophy and, and I met with him and I said, you know, I don't know if I should choose this as a, a, a profession. Uh, I said, because, you know, I just don't know if I'll be able to get a job and make money and do this for it. And he said, well, uh, I know a, a really famous guy who studied a lot of philosophy that you might have heard of. And I said, who's that? He said, Steve Martin. <laughs> so Steve Martin used a lot of his philosophy to go on into the world of comedy. So I'm not guaranteeing you, you know, that I'm going to teach you to be some great comedian if you study philosophy. But 
is he's an example of a person who, who studied philosophy. And I, I don't know if he just did undergrad or if he went further than that, but he utilized that to uh, kind of give him a unique approach to comedy. And although we look back on Steve Martin as kind of a typical, you know, boomer, uh, 70s, 80s comedian, when Steve Martin came out in the 70s, he was very unique and very weird and odd in his approach. And I think that, and as my professor was arguing, that had to do with his uh, taking of a lot of philosophy classes when he was a younger guy. So philosophy does help us to think creatively because it gives us new angles and new ways to approach questions and things in the world. Philosophy helps us systematize and particularize knowledge. And again, a classic example of this is that the taxonomy that we still use today for animals, kingdom, phylum, species, et cetera, genera, that's from Aristotle. Aristotle, the great philosopher of uh, of Greece, uh, the student of, of Plato, gives us that taxonomy that we still use today.